Hello, I'm Dr. Paul Evans, Vice President and Dean of Marion University College of Osteopathic Medicine. I want to talk today about um, the concept of clinical physicians who are considering a career in academic medicine, either in the colleges or in uh, graduate medical education. This uh, presentation will give you some ideas as to how to make a transition from seeing patients in the clinic and in the hospital to actually uh, working in a teaching environment. So it's called uh, academic survival. Uh, the reason why we talked in those um, constructs is academic survival in, uh, actually has certain aspects that one needs to know in order to be successful. And so we're going to go over some of those concepts in this uh, presentation. Academic uh, careers in osteopathic medicine, in fact, are different than clinical practice. Uh, there are specific skill sets involved in teaching, in service, and in scholarly activities that one needs to be aware of. And these skills are usually not taught in medical school or in residency or fellowship. Um, survival, success, and advancement require um, these competencies uh, in order to be successful and faculty development activities are important to get these skills and to learn these skills and to use these skills. So the uh, objectives of this presentation, and this is actually going to be a two-part presentation. Um, the first part will cover skills having to do with common pathways for careers in academic osteopathic medicine for the pre-doctoral arena, that is the colleges of osteopathic medicine. Um, we will describe qualifications and skills needed to advance in this pathway in part one, and then we will do the same thing um, a little bit later on in part two for the graduate medical education piece. We will learn some skills on how to fulfill requirements in teaching and service and in scholarly activity and actually define those um, in terms of the specific academic ranks and in terms of the actual uh, professional uh, positions that one might hold in, in an acad academic medicine environment. And then, last but not least, we will review some obstacles for advancement and some of the strategies that you would have to consider in order to overcome them. Um, I love this slide because my buddy Yoda, who is always wise, talks about things that really have meaning. And he who fails to plan in academic careers plans to fail. So you must have a plan in order to increase your ability to be successful. Um, the second piece is you must begin with the end in mind. So if you want a career in academic medicine and you have a particular position that you want to uh, assume, then you have to understand what the qualifications are for that p position and then work to get those qualifications. Um, you also have to understand that first things have to be done first and you have to make sure that the priorities are um, selected for your own career advancement and then understand that if you're going to be competitive you must be better than the folks that you are working with to get these very um, competitive positions and in order to do that you're going to have to be a little bit different to succeed. Okay, well what are these uh, common career pathways and uh, what are the skills that we need? Um, what are the timelines for typical advancement in uh, academic positions in pre-doctoral areas? And again, this is part one we're going to focus on colleges of osteopathic medicine. What timelines uh, and uh, uh, abilities to earn these skills do you have to think about? And then how can I document uh, the fact that I, in fact, have uh, obtained the competencies, competencies that I need in order to show that I have these skills. So here's the COMPATH. Um, uh, it's a full-time Faculty College of Osteopathic Medicine process. Uh, it consists of some academic ranks, and we're all familiar with these, Assistant Clinical Professor, Associate Clinical Professor, and Clinical Professor and um, a department chair, which is kind of the top level in this pathway. Um, there are skills and experiences that you must have in order to determine success for these roles. 
All right, so this is probably most important. Um, and rule number one for success in, uh, in College of Osteopathic Medicine teaching, if you are an excellent osteopathic physician, you have the ability to assume these positions. But if you are not, you will not have the peer respect that you need to be um, successful. So it's imperative that you make sure that you are an excellent osteopathic physician first before you decide to go into these pathways. Well, how do you get started? Well, most uh, faculty members start at the assistant professor level. And uh, l let me just make an aside here. Um, one of the reasons why I'm, uh, I've developed this teaching module is I've had uh, significant experience in hiring uh, new faculty, in promoting new faculty. I've been uh, the founding dean of two new osteopathic schools, which means that I've had to hire quite a number of people and learn uh, how to make sure that uh, the qualified people get into the positions that are important for uh, the institution. And, and I'm going to share some of these experiences with you to help you to understand how someone looks at um, your skills, your applications, um, your ability to say, I'm qualified for this job. Okay, so let's move forward. Um, the assistant professor is usually residency trained and AOA board certified. Uh, they frequently are fellowship certified uh, if it's a subspecialty area that you're, you're trying to uh, uh, obtain a teaching position in. And you must have uh, a minimum of being a proficient clinician. And by proficient, uh, I'm referring to the Dreyfus model, which talks about six levels of competency, novice, advanced, beginner, competent, proficient, expert, and mastery. So you have to have a minimum of proficiency to be a successful assistant professor. Um, you have to have had a track record as a good teacher, as a resident, or a fellow. And if someone is looking at your credentials, you get extra points if you've been a chief resident, if you've been named resident of the year, if you've done research, if you have publications on your CV, and if you've received awards. How about the associate professor? Well, this is kind of the mid-level. Um, usually this is about seven years from the assistant professor appointment time frame. Um, you should probably be considered a regional or national uh, expert in your specialty. Uh, for the three domains in teaching, you should be well known as a good teacher and have quality uh, behind your name in, in how you teach. You should have significant skills in pedagogy, in curriculum design, in assessment, and in remediation processes for students. Um, you should have given multiple regional or national lectures and presentations and you should have mentoring skills to help your students and also your other uh, faculty members. Uh, in terms of service, you must probably have advanced to the expert level in your clinical discipline. You should have a very strong clinical reputation and productivity in your department. Uh, you should have local, regional, and national committee experience, and you probably should have shown some leadership in administration and uh, related skills in your department. For scholarly activities, uh, most medical schools want uh, associate professor level uh, faculty members to have um, good research uh, in your field uh, and to have published probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 peer-reviewed publications um, as part of your uh, CV and portfolio. How about if uh, at the professor level? Uh, at the professor level, you're expected to have a national or even an international reputation for your uh, specialty. Uh, you should be an authoritative teacher. You should be able to show that you have excellent ratings from both students and from your peers. And you should have national and keynote presentations as part of your uh, CV. Uh, in terms of service, your clinical uh, level should be at the expert or mastery level. Um, you should have very strong uh, reputation for giving good clinical care. Uh, you should be members of local, regional, and even national level committees. 
Uh, you should have some leadership positions. For example, uh, uh, the chair of a, a, a committee at a national organization, an, a, a high-level officer in your specialty group, uh, things like that. Um, you should have demonstrative administrative skills in your academic unit, and you should have strong mentoring skills to assist the junior faculty and also uh, students in your program. For scholarly activities, uh, most uh, professor level faculty members um, participate in things like reviewing for journals, like uh, being a reviewer for grants, uh, like uh, being on committees for dissertations. Um, you should have a number of grants, uh, consultant um, experience uh, activities, and even been a visiting lecturer in some areas. These are all strong skills that are important for this level of uh, academic ability. And most uh, promotion committees in terms of guidelines would like to see about 20 or more peer-reviewed publications or books or chapters or things like that. All right, how about a department chair? Well, this is a senior level physician. It's usually a professor. Um, in terms of clinical abilities, they should be an expert or a mastery level person. Um, they should be an accomplished presenter and scholar. So you, you should have a very, very good reputation. Uh, the department chair supervises all specialty activities in the classroom, in the lab, in the clinical areas, and so you should have the ability to, uh, to do those activities. Um, department chairs have strong skills in leadership, in uh, organization, in administration. Uh, you should be able to design and, and take care of and manage a budget. Uh, you should be comfortable hiring and firing and doing HR activities, uh, participating in accreditation visits and preparations, planning, uh, curriculum development, uh, assessment of, of students and programs, management policy and governance uh, of the medical school and the college or university um, that you're participating in. Uh, additionally, a department chair also represents the specialty that that they are in, in the college, in the hospital, in the community, and actually nationally. So you should have the ability to uh, communicate and to represent your department and your school in uh, external organizations. So in summary for part one, um, academic medical skills for those who are interested in transitioning from clinical care to academic medicine are in fact different than clinical skills. There are defined skills in teaching, in uh, both clinical and institutional service, and in scholarship. Uh, these skills must be learned, and the outcomes of the learning and the competencies that you have obtained, in fact, have to be documented, and these are documented on the curriculum vitae and also on the portfolio. Um, and academic qualifications help define uh, promotion for academic physicians and also career advancement.